dystrophy. So to quickly summarize what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it is a neuromuscular disorder. It is an X-linked disease, uh, which means it is passed on uh, genetically as well. Some of the patients can also have sporadic mutations in the gene. Uh, the gene mutation that is responsible for this disease is dystrophin gene. And absence uh, of dystrophin gene leads to absence of dystrophin formation in the muscles. Now, dystrophin is a protein in the muscle which is very essential uh, to have uh, the structural or the skeletal muscle, uh, the skeletal uh, integrity, to, uh, to save the skeletal integrity of the muscle. And uh, in absence of this dystrophin protein, the muscle cells start dying even with the normal or regular contractile stresses or normal day to day activities. So this leads to progressive muscle degeneration. Unfortunately, there is no definite medical or surgical treatment for this disease. And we see that uh, the children progressively deteriorate in their strength and function. And uh, by the age of, uh, so somewhere in their third decade of life, between 20 to 30 years, they either uh, go on the ventilator or uh, that's, that is their lifespan. So what, act what actually happens in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy? What is the pathophysiological uh, processes that go on in this disease? Now, uh, to put it simply, there is muscle damage or muscle injury. Uh, with every action that the child performs, there is minor damage to the muscles. Like in uh, non-dystrophic muscles or like in children who don't have muscular dystrophy, whenever there is muscle damage, the cells repair that damage. Now this process is intact in muscular dystrophy also. But where a normal or uh, a non-dystrophic uh, child, when he performs a movement, there would be 10 muscles damaged. In muscular dystrophy, it is enhanced. That uh, proportion of damage is increased by almost 100 folds. So therefore, the repair mechanisms fall short in Duchenne muscular dystrophy children. So to quickly summarize the pathophysiology of DMD, the muscle injury is much more than the repair mechanisms can handle. And therefore, there is progressive muscle weakness in the body. And we see that this weakness starts uh, by the age of five years, because that's where the repair mechanisms actually fail. So we can say that muscle uh, muscular dystrophy is actually a stem cell disease. What that means is stem cells are the cells or, or these are the repair mechanisms of the body. You see in, this, uh, in these diagrams, the first diagram shows that these are the stem cells or the satellite cells that are available in a non-dystrophic muscle. Now, whenever there is injury, these cells repair the muscle and the muscle becomes back to normal. But if you can see here, the number of uh, stem cells or the satellite cells that were available to the muscle reduces. Same happens in the dystrophic muscle also. So the stem cells repair the damage to the muscle. If you see here, there is a damage to the muscle and stem cells repair it. But there are two things that are different as compared to non-dystrophic muscle repair. First, there is fibrosis, which was not there in the non-dystrophic muscle. So muscle tissue is not replaced by new muscle tissue, but also the adipose or the fat tissue and the fibrotic tissue. So if you see here, there's a process of fibrosis going on. And if you see the number of muscle cells, uh, sorry, number of stem cells or the satellite cells is much lesser as compared to in the non dystrophic muscle. So this is the, this is also one of the contributing factors to why muscular dystrophy, adhesion muscular dystrophy progresses, the weakness in this condition progresses. Apart from this, there are multiple other pathophysiological mechanisms that play a role in adhesion muscular dystrophy. So yes, the primary reason is that there is a gene that is faulty, which leads to faulty protein formation in the muscle, which causes muscle cells to be very fragile and they break at uh, even the normal stresses of day-to-day -day activities. And therefore, there is progressive weakness. That is the fundamental reason or fundamental pathophysiological mechanism. Along with this, 
there are many, many other things that happen. So to start, first, as I said, it is the sequel of the genetic abnormality, exhaustion of stem cells. The third one is chronic inflammation. What does this mean? Whenever there is damage or injury in the body, uh, body repairs or heals that part with inflammation. Inflammation is the process of repair, or inflammation is essential to start the repair process. Now, because there is continuous injury happening to the muscles in these children, the inflammation in the body is also chronic. Now, there are certain negative, uh, there are certain negative sides of unchecked inflammation. Inflammation is a process of uh, repair, but what it does is it also kills the the damage of the faulty tissue. If the inflammation is unchecked, then it can also damage the healthy tissue surrounding the area of injury or damage. So chronic inflammation also uh, hampers the health of healthy muscle tissue that is available in these children. Now, this also, uh, this chronic inflammation also contributes to lack of blood supply. But there is something called as vasogenic ischemia. What does this mean? So as I said, the muscles in the body are affected. Largely, these are the skeletal muscles. But there are some, some studies that suggest that the muscles that are present in the blood vessels can also be hampered because of the dystrophy process. So they are functional, but not as much as in the non-dystrophic individual, because of which the blood supply becomes sluggish in these uh, children's blood vessels. And this leads to vasogenic ischemia, that is uh, lack of blood supply due to abnormality in the blood vessels itself. Then there is upregulation of apoptotic processes. Now apoptotic process is the process of cell death. Whenever a cell dies or that is damaged, it uh, eventually dies and it has to be then um, taken out of that environment. It has to be degraded and new cells replace uh, these damaged or dead tissue. This process of uh, killing the damaged cell to take it out, to you know, to sort of scavenge it and, and take it away, is called apoptosis. Now, because there is chronic inflammation, the apoptotic processes are also upregulated. What it means is it's increased uh, as compared to non-dystrophic. Uh, individuals and therefore the healthy tissue is at risk of apoptosis even when it's not damaged. Thirdly, fibrosis. This is, I briefly explained this before also. What happens is when muscle is damaged, in a non dystrophic individual, muscle is replaced by muscle tissue. But in dystrophic individuals, muscle can be replaced by fat and fibrotic tissue. So, kind of like scar formation within the muscle. Now, what is the harm of this fibrotic process? Fibrosis, of weak, fibrosis is a way of healing. But in fibrosis, uh, tissue loses their own properties. So if your hand is cut and there is a scar, the color of the scar is different. The sensibility of the skin on the scar area is different because it loses the function of the skin tissue. Similarly, in the muscles, when fat and fibrotic tissues are replaced, they lose the, obviously they lose the function of the muscle, which is to contract and to extend. And these tissues cannot do that. These tissues are not as elastic as the muscle. And therefore the muscles become weaker and weaker because of this fibrosis. Now there is muscle atrophy due to abnormal nerve signaling as well. So, so far we said that this is a muscle disorder and muscles are damaged because genetically uh, the dystrophy is not formed. But dystrophin is not only in the muscles. Dystrophin is also found in the uh, nerve covering, the Schwann cells that form the myelin of the nerves. Dystrophin is found in that. Dystrophin is found in retina. Dystrophin is found in kidneys. There are multiple tissues in the body where dystrophin is important for their function. And if uh, the covering of the nerves is not proper, uh, formed properly, then they're also at the risk of damage or not forming or developing uh, appropriately. And therefore, it is called as a neuromuscular disorder where nerves and muscles are uh, at an equal risk of being damaged. Although muscles are predominant, there may be some nerve damage and abnormalities in the nerve signaling also. And that's 
what uh, can also contribute further to the muscle pathology. Now, uh, what is the usual natural history of fusion muscular dystrophy? How does the disease progress? So, if we see in the zero to three years, usually there is no, um, there are no evident symptoms of the disease. There may be some like, uh, you know, there may be swollen calves that parents may notice. There may be mild delay in achieving their milestones. Um, but apart from that, nothing is very evident. Between the age of five to seven is when the disease becomes more evident and parents notice there's something wrong or there's something different about their children. And if you see here, this is a classic sign of fusion muscular dystrophy called Bober's sign. When the child is not able to get up from the floor without taking support on his own body. So they kind of climb onto themselves to stand up because of the weakness of different muscles, which we will come to see in some times. And as uh, the weakness progresses, usually we see that by the uh, age of 12 years, these children are not able to walk anymore. So they become wheelchair bound. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, early second decade or third decade, we see that they have respiratory complications and heart conditions, uh, which uh, which doesn't uh, which doesn't allow their lifespan to be prolonged more than that. And many of the children can uh, go on the ventilator support at, at this age. So, uh, how is this progressive deterioration uh, seen uh, in the Musculoskeletal MRI. It is very important to see these images for you to understand how this fibrotic process will process. If you see here, as the age progresses, the black part is the muscle and the white part is the fat tissue. So if you see here, the black is muscle and the white part is fat tissue. Now, as it as the age increases, you can see that the white part is increasing, and this you see at the age of 16, there is hardly any muscle left. It's all fibro fatty tissue. And I apologize, I have written it wrongly at the bottom of the scale. The black part is the muscle and the white part is the fibro fatty tissue. Now, how does it see, uh, how does it look on the diffusion tensor imaging? Diffusion tensor imaging uh, shows us how many muscle fibers are there and the existing muscle fibers, how are they functioning? So in the images that are about to come, if you see here, at the age of five years, there are there is a dense uh, network of muscle fiber. And you see that the muscle fiber density is very high. There's hardly any space in between. And uh, if you see the muscle hypoactivation is shown as blue and muscle hyperactivation is shown by red. So how much a particular muscle fiber is working? See here, it is almost, uh, it is within the normal range at five years where the symptoms are not very predominant. As the age progresses, you can see that the muscle fibers are becoming scanty. So the density of the muscle fibers is also reducing and the fibers that are existing, their functioning is increasing because they have to perform those activities and there aren't enough muscles to do it. So the, uh, the muscles that are there are overactive. But that is only till the age of 10 years. If you see here at 11, 12, the hyperactivity again goes down a little bit. And that's because this is the age where there is likely transition onto the wheelchair, um, onto the wheelchair. So the children are not able to walk anymore. Because of this, suddenly the functional requirement from the muscles drops. And because of that, the amount of firing also reduces. But if you see the muscles uh, continue to grow scanty and scanty and at the 16 years, if you compare 5 years and 16 years, uh, there is thick, dense muscle uh, tissue at the age of 5 years, where there is fibro fatty tissue, uh, very scanty muscle fibers at the age of 21 years. So this, of course, it doesn't happen all at the same time. There are different stages of the disease. There are different um, uh, age groups which can be divided based on their functionality. And if you see, uh, there are five stages. One is pre-symptomatic stage. Second is early ambulatory stage. Third is late ambulatory stage. Fourth is early non-ambulatory stage. And fifth is late non-ambulatory stage. 
So how does the rehabilitation in these different phases differ? So I'm going to tell you about the rehab first and then go on to the description of the phases. And we will come back to this slide uh, if time permits and if required. Why I want to talk about the rehab already is because the management of muscular dystrophy, fusion muscular dystrophy, is multidisciplinary. If you can see here, it requires management from physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, aquatic therapy, orthopedic management of the contractures, nutritional management, gastrointestinal management, respiratory management, psychological intervention, and cardiac management. So all of this is very essential, but not uh, at the same time. It's not necessary that all of this is required at the same time. And the requirement of this will change in different phases of the disease or different stages of the disease. So what happens in stage one? Uh, in stage one, the rehabilitative requirement for the child is very less because the child at that time does not have any symptoms uh, that are very evident. But yes, uh, therapeutic exercises can be started at that early age also. But what is very crucial in this stage is psychological intervention, especially for the parents, because they need to understand how to take care of their child going ahead and what therapies would be required, what do they need to do, what new options, treatment options are available for them, and how the child can be given the best possible care, and at the same time, how parents should take care of themselves. So this kind of a psychological counseling and intervention is required in stage one. In stage two, physiotherapy is very important, the exercises must start. Occupational therapy in stage two may or may not be essential, as the child is still completely functional in this phase. So what is the difference between physiotherapy and occupational therapy? Physiotherapy focuses on the physical functionality uh, of the patient and uh, physiotherapists make use of physical modalities to achieve maximum functional independence. Uh, this not necessarily be day-to-day -day activities. So function, by function, I mean body function. So ability to walk, ability to climb stairs, ability to speak, ability to sit up, all of this comes under physiotherapy exercises. Occupational therapists focus on how to perform day-to-day -day activities with the available strength uh, that the child has and how to make the child as independent as possible with the abilities that the child has. So, at this stage, uh, occupational therapy may not be very essential. Aquatic therapy is very important. So aquatic therapy uh, means physiotherapy or occupational therapy performed in the water environment. We will come uh, in detail about all of these exercise modalities uh, in, in subsequently in this uh, presentation. And I will let you know what is the importance of each of the exercise types that we, have, we are discussing over here. Uh, apart from that, respiratory management, uh, it's not, we don't need to have respiratory management as there are no respiratory symptoms, but a preventive therapy can be started so that uh, when the muscles undergo weakness, they are better prepared. Psychological intervention, again, at this stage is not very crucial. If uh, parents need more support, it can be extended. Now, stage three. Again, physiotherapy is very important. Physiotherapy management has to start uh, in phase two only and it has to continue in phase three as well. Your occupational therapy is important because this, this is the phase where children may, um, they are about on the verge of losing their ability to walk. Uh, some children may also show difficulties in overhead activities or the arm movements. And that's why they may need some modification to perform their day-to-day -day activities. This uh, phase also requires, so there's a lot of fatigability, which means children get tired very easily. So energy conservation techniques is something that has to be taught to the child as well as the parents. And that can be uh, done by the occupational therapist. Aquatic therapy is again very essential in this stage. Orthopedic management may be required uh, depending upon the kind of contractures the child has developed or the muscle tightness the child has developed and what uh, effect it has on its uh, on the child's functionality. Nutritional management, because towards this uh, in in this phase, uh, the child's movements or uh, activity starts reducing. 
they may also try start losing their appetite and start eating less and less and therefore nutritional management is very important when there is so much going on in the body already there is chronic inflammation there is loss of uh, mobility the nutrition has to be very good because that is the support system of the body to counter all the problems or all the damage that is going on in the body and therefore nutritional management may be required at this stage Although it may not be essential as a treatment option, uh, respiratory management again usually children do not develop respiratory problems at this stage, but they can be taught respiratory exercises as a preventive measure, and uh, in this uh, stage itself, psychological intervention is also not mandatory, but depending upon the support required by the child and the parents, uh, it may be necessary. Cardiac management now, uh, along with muscles, uh, skeletal muscles, even heart is a muscle. So, although it is not as badly damaged as that of the skeletal muscles, heart may also start showing some uh, signs of dysfunction. This can happen uh, in some children uh, very early in third stage. Usually, cardiac issues uh, we see that they crop up at fourth or fifth stage of the disease but some children may show early onset of these issues uh, so cardiac management is very essential it need not be a treatment or a therapeutic management but a vigilance to see if they are developing any cardiac issues so by this stage we should definitely start checking the ECG and to the echo to see the cardiac function this is the phase which where they will also require uh, these special devices or supportive devices. Now, this is a device which is uh, called ankle foot orthosis, which is required for supporting the foot drop uh, with, uh, that they may develop. Uh, more than the foot drop, these they, they, these children develop uh, deformities which hinder the, uh, their walking, and so this device can help them. This is a splint that can that is used for uh, preventing knee buckling because the strength in the knee is very poor and this is another shoe that can prevent uh, deformities uh, at the ankle joint now in stage four again physiotherapy must continue occupational therapy also must continue speech therapy may be necessary at this stage because they may develop tongue hypertrophy which may uh, which may lead to slurring not slurring but slight speech disturbances and some of them may uh, also have swallowing difficulty because of which at night they may develop some aspiration. What is the meaning of aspiration? Aspiration is, is when uh, we are swallowing our saliva involuntarily. So we all do that. When, when we are sleeping, when we are awake, we are doing something, we are swallowing our saliva continuously and we don't come to know about that. It is not a thoughtful action. It's like breathing. You don't, we don't come to know every time we breathe. Similarly, we don't come to know every time we swallow the saliva. Now, especially in sleep, uh, because all the muscles of the body and all the body processes are relaxed, uh, it may happen that in these children, the saliva, instead of being swallowed and entering the stomach or the gastrointestinal tract, it can enter the lungs in very small amounts. So there is leakage of saliva into the lungs which can give rise to recurrent infections like pneumonia and that can be fatal for the children also so speech therapy is essential to find out if they are developing the swallowing difficulty if there is any risk of aspiration and if it is found that there is a risk then the child needs to take speech therapy as a treatment as well to improve their swallowing ability Again, aquatic therapy must continue as well for uh, for you know preserving their uh, muscle strength for improving their posture. Here, orthopedic management may become more uh, more required uh, because of their contractures. They may also develop deformities like scoliosis or the spinal deformities in this stage. Nutritional management is very essential in this stage. Because in stage four, children stop walking. They have already stopped walking. As we saw, stage four is early non-ambulatory phase. So when children are not walking, they are wheelchair bound, their mobility is considerably reduced 
So this gives rise to a lot of gastrointestinal problems like constipation, indigestion, loss of appetite, and because of this, their nutrition suffers. Also, the gastrointestinal tract or our intestines, they are also formed of muscles. So what is called as the peristaltic movement or the movement of the food inside the gastrointestinal tract, which is caused by the contraction of these muscles is also affected. Not entirely like the skeletal muscles become dysfunctional, these muscles don't become completely dysfunctional, but their function is affected. They are hypofunctional. And because of this, they develop uh, issues like constipation, which further leads to lack of appetite. And therefore, gastrointestinal management may also be important at this stage. Again, respiratory management is now essential. So we saw that in stage two and stage three, it was not mandatory. It was more of a preventive care that needed to be provided, uh, that needed to be given to the children. But here in stage four, respiratory care becomes very important because children may develop respiratory muscle weakness at this stage. And even if they don't, they are certainly to develop that in stage five. And so it is important to preserve that mus the muscle strength. Secondly, because they are in wheelchair, they are uh, in bed where they're not able to move themselves, they're not able to roll, they're not able to sit up, because of which the movement of the rib cage becomes very restricted. So the lungs do not expand as much as they would when the child is standing and is more active. And therefore respiratory management becomes more important. Also the abdominal muscles become weak and because of which their cough reflex is also poor. Now what is cough reflex? So whenever something uh, goes enters into our windpipe, we automatically cough. So none of us cough voluntarily, thinking about it, we don't cough. If the cough is a reflex action. Now, although it is a reflex action, if the muscles are weak, the, the strength of the cough, with which or the intensity with which we can cough is hindered. So we notice that in old people, their cough is very feeble. Now, what is the disadvantage or what is the bad effect of this? When people are not able to cough with very high intensity, the secretions tend to accumulate in the lungs. And that can give rise to A, infection, and B, not proper oxygen um, uh, movement or the improper ventilation of the air in the lungs, which can give rise to a hypoxia or uh, inability to provide enough oxygen to the tissues. And therefore, respiratory exercises are very important in this stage. Psychological intervention. At this stage, the children are old enough to understand what is happening with them and uh, be affected by that much more than the earlier stages. Because this stage is also the first stage of immobility. And this is a stage where they enter in their teenagers. There are various hormonal changes happening in the body and at the same time, the mobility is restricted. Now, this can give rise to a lot of psychological issues in the children. This can also give rise to a lot of behavioral issues in the children. And therefore, psychological intervention is necessary, not only for the children, but also for the parents, because they may not understand how to deal with these behavioral and psychological issues. Most often, what we see is parents may, uh, parents tend to, uh, listen to their children uh, and give in to their demands uh, because of some sympathy factor that they may have for the child or because they feel uh, that they want to do everything possible for their children and whatever the child wants the parents want to provide this can lead to certain behavioral issues where children may become demanding they may become um, uh, non-cooperative uh, to doing the treatments and the rehabilitation. So here a psychologist plays a very important role. And cardiac management. By, by stage four, uh, heart issues may set in uh, in, many of, in, in many of the children of Fusion Muscular Dystrophy. What are these heart issues? First is um, the reduction in the ejection fraction of the, uh, of the heart. The ventricles. Uh, now, 
what it means is that the amount of blood that is pumped out by the heart is reducing with each stroke. So there's more retention of blood in the heart also. And that can hamper the heart tissue as well as the body functioning also. If there's not enough blood being pumped out by the heart, the body will not be able to function. And therefore, it is important to start certain cardiac medicines uh, in this stage. Medicines may also be started in stage 3 itself if on uh, the reports like ECG and TB echo, uh, doctors notice anything is wrong or doctors notice that there is some abnormality there. Now, in this stage, uh, the orthotic devices that are required are more so for the upper extremity. Because by this stage, they've already lost the functionality, functionality of the lower limbs. The upper limbs are also involved. So they may need elbow splints, they may need glasses uh, to hold uh, from both the sides so that you can lift it up without uh, much of trouble. With one hand, it may be too much, but with both the hands, they may be able to do it. Uh, if you see the plates, because they are, they are not able to secure or hold um, the spoons in the fork properly, they may uh, you know, they may spill the food out of the plate, so there, there is a cover here which uh, prevents from spilling. And there's another uh, supportive splint where they can press their elbow, because the shoulder muscle might have undergone on weakness. In the stage five, you can see everything, uh, all of these management are very important. Um, it may not be required as frequently as, as in other phases. In stage five, uh, the aim of rehabilitation is more of maintenance of the function and prevention of any complications. And here, the assistive devices that the children may require are a BiPAP and the ventilator, so all the respiratory assistive devices. Now let's come to and let's understand what actually happens in all the phases. So in first phase, uh, which is a pre-symptomatic phase, uh, usually there are no symptoms. And if you see all of the muscles of the body, uh, there may be weakness in the neck flexors and the gluteal muscles. Now, this is not always evident uh, clinically, but if tested by a physiotherapist or if tested by a doctor, they, may, they will be able to perceive this weakness in the neck flexion. So, the muscles that lead that cause bending of the neck and uh, the hip muscles that are required for, uh, for the leg movements. So as I said, there are no symptoms evident, but the, some of these things may suggest of the pathology. Uh, it can be that the children have delayed milestone. They have some of the children they have floppy limbs. What it means is loosened up hands, uh, and uh, so uh, they are not able to stabilize uh, themselves very well. Uh, they may be slower in performing certain activities as compared to their uh, non-dystrophic uh, counterparts. There may be uh, increased serum uh, phosphokinase levels, uh, sorry, serum creatine phosphokinase levels. This is an enzyme which is found uh, to be elevated in the blood when there is muscle injury. So this enzyme can be hundreds of thousand times more in children with DMD as compared to non-dystrophic children. So even though the symptoms are not uh, evident, this enzyme can still be more because there is considerably higher muscle injury in these children, which is not visible because the repair mechanisms or the stem cells are able to repair that damage in time. In stage two, this is the time when you see that a lot of symptoms start showing up and the progression is uh, quite fast as compared to stage one and stage four and five. So two and three are past progressive stages and you see that a lot of muscles start getting damaged or start getting uh, becoming weak in this stage. So if you see here, we see that uh, there is weakness of the quadricep muscle of the leg, there's weakness of the peroneal muscles, there's weakness of the abdominal muscles, latissimus, the back extensors also, gluteal muscles, lower trapezius. Now deltoids, uh, the muscles of the shoulder, they start getting affected, uh, and the triceps, they start getting affected in this phase. But the strength is maintained uh, very well. Or they are not as weak as the other muscles of the lower extremity and trunk. 
Now, because of this, what happens uh, is that the children are not able to perform certain activities like climbing up the stairs, getting up from the floor. So this is when the Gower sign becomes very evident. Now, what is Gower sign? So if you can see here, the child starts climbing up on, uh, on, on their body to stand up. That is the Gower sign. So these are the symptoms that we see in stage one. The Gower sign is positive. Children walk on their toes. If you can see, the heel is raised over here. There is difficulty in climbing stairs. They fall frequently because the balance is very poor. They get tired easily, so they are not able to play uh, as much as the other children, or they are not able to run as fast as the other children. Their walking balance is very poor, and they may have a waddling gait where they um, they don't really lift up the legs so much, but they shift uh, their weight from one side to the other and walk like. Uh, uh, how we see people walking in old age when there is muscle weakness. So what uh, what should be done in this phase? So active exercises should be performed in this phase. Why active exercises? So active exercises is basically performing all the movements of the body yourself. It is very essential to do these exercises in this phase because this is what is going to build the muscle fiber and this is what is going to improve the health of muscle fiber while we can preserve, uh, preserve it because there is a lot of muscle tissue available to work on in this phase. So it's important that these exercises are performed. This is usually uh, done by the physiotherapist or aquatic therapist. Most of the pictures I've shown are of land. We will talk about water exercises later on. So this is for hip muscles. Uh, you can see uh, it's for hip flexion and bending the hip, straightening the hip. Then there is exercises for the uh, hip again in the lying position. There's exercises for the knee to bend and to straighten the knee. Exercises for the foot. There are exercises for the trunk muscles where you can see this is for back extension where the child is looking up with the help uh, of the... This is the support is only so that uh, there is no risk of fall. But otherwise everything is done by the child himself. This is also for uh, abdominal. Now, this is not the correct, uh, the most correct way of performing this exercise. But the reason I put this photo is to show the amount of neck weakness that the child has. If you see here, he's having difficulty in holding the head up also. And that is what uh, we had shown in the, I had shown in the beginning that there is weakness in the neck flexion. Uh, this is a better way of performing uh, abdominal exercises where the child is better supported. And this is for the lower abdominals where the child is pulling the legs towards the dog. These are actively performed by the child. Another thing that can be done is rolling. So these are all bed mobility exercises which are very crucial uh, and uh, should be repeated frequently. So rolling, uh, kneeling. So the child is standing upon the knees. This is essential to build the strength of the gluteal muscles and the abdominal muscles as well as back exercise, the postural muscles. And so this exercise is very important to prolong their ability to walk. Again, uh, these are the exercises in uh, crawling for hip and shoulder. We, there are also exercises performed in a crawling position for the trunk, that is the abdominal muscles and the back extensors. We have to also start with balance exercises in this phase. So if you see, this is a balance board. This is one of the examples of balance exercises that can be performed. There are multiple other ways of doing that. But balance exercises where they are able to shift the weight from one side to the other. What happens is because of weakness, these children learn different patterns of movement, which are not uh, typical patterns of walking. So their gait becomes very different as compared to gait of non-restricted children. And the first thing that you observe is their weight shift. So the ability to shift weight from one leg to the other is hampered in these children. A, because of weakness. B, because of poor balance. So they are not able to balance themselves very well. And therefore, the body doesn't want to push itself into the uh, onto the another leg because it's more unstable position, which requires a lot of muscle strength especially of the anti-gravity muscles like hip muscles, which are affected at this stage. So this weight shifting is very crucial to, again, prolong their ability to walk and to prevent certain uh, deformities or to prevent um, certain tightness of the muscles. 
uh, you can further give once they're able to achieve the weight shift you can give reach out so that uh, you're challenging them more to do the uh, balance activities again you know, here in all the different directions we can give reach outs similarly these this can be done in sitting also now the sitting balance also needs to be trained in the phase four where they become non-ambulatory but they may require considerable amount of support like if you can see here also i'm supporting them quite a lot uh, to perform these uh, activities and probably in the later stage we will not use the vestibular ball. Now stage 3 or the late ambulatory stage. Now here of course all of the muscles that we saw in the second phase are affected, I have not highlighted them, I have only highlighted the new uh, or the uh, muscles that show enhanced weakness in this phase. So if you see your peroneals and uh, the quadriceps, they undergo severe weakness in this stage. And that's what leads to uh, inability to walk eventually uh, in the early non ambulatory phase. So if you see here, there is increased arching of the back. If you see the child, when he stands, the arching of the back is much more. This is because of severe muscle weakness. They have to uh, stabilize their posture. And the only way to stabilize is uh, the posture is to put the bones uh, in touch with each other and therefore they develop a lot of uh, abnormal postures and abnormal body movements. Uh, they, the gait is completely changed now, they walk on toes, there is a lot of distance between the two feet, the base of support increases, the back is arched completely, um, they will walk from one side to the other, the hand movements also reduce uh, because they, they don't want to do a lot of uh, challenging movements that may challenge their balance. Uh, there is easy fatigability in performing the hand activities also. So to lift the hands up and down, they may be fatigued. They are not able to climb the stairs. Most of the children in this phase are not able to climb the stairs. Some may be able to climb the stairs with support. They have difficulty in getting up from the chair. So if you see here, so this child is not able to stand up straight without holding onto the chair. He has to turn, take the support of the chair, push himself up and when he stands, again he's standing with a lot of arching of the back and he's standing on the toes, there's a lot of distance in between his feet. So this is what usually we would see in grade 3. Uh, there would be increasing foot and leg deformities because the muscles are undergoing weakness they're learning this pattern. So if you see the child is continuously walking on the toes, then the calf muscles will become tight. Because they're walking with a large base of support with their toes pointing outwards. So there will be tightnesses in the high muscles also. Now in this stage, they may require splints to walk. So a child can walk with splints without any other external support of walker or, uh, or the stick or they may require both walker as well as the splints. So the major weakness seen in this stage is in the lower body or is in the legs. And therefore if we give some support to this, we can prolong their ability to walk or we can prolong their functionality as well. Some cardiovascular and gastrointestinal symptoms may be evident as I've explained before. So in this phase, what is necessary? Uh, something called as suspension exercises. So I will come to uh, the reasoning behind why these exercises are given and what kind of activities help in muscular dystrophy and what kind of activities can harm in muscular dystrophy. So suspension exercises. These are the exercises that are active or active assisted wherein they are supported. The child is performing the exercise himself but they may be supported by a sling which is tied to the ceiling and the leg or the arm or whichever body part we are trying to exercise is suspended in that swing. The most important feature of these exercise, uh, exercises is that it eliminates the effect of gravity. All of these exercises are performed in gravity eliminated plane. Now what is gravity eliminated plane? We all know that we live on earth and whatever movement we perform, there is gravity acting on our body all the time. So the movements are performed against gravity. So when we are doing movements that are from, you know, from down to up, like I'm bending my elbow, this is an against gravity movement. 
because the gravity is trying to pull my hand down, but I am trying to pull my hand up. So this is against gravity. Now, what is gravity eliminated? Now, if I lift my shoulder like this and extend my arm, then the gravity is not acting on elbow anymore. Of course, gravity is acting to pull my elbow down and the shoulder down. So my shoulder is acting against gravity to hold my arm up, but the elbow is free. And it is moving without the effect of gravity. Now, when the muscles undergo weakness, so in these children, we see that the muscles that uh, work against gravity for longer time, these are called postural muscles, or the muscles that help us be upright. So the muscles of the back of the thigh, the gluteal muscles, uh, the back extensors, the abdominal muscles, the neck flexors, these are all the muscles that we see uh, the peroneal muscles that help us to feel, they, uh, they, they, have to lift, they have to be lifted up like this to be able to walk so that they don't slap the ground. These muscles, they undergo weakness very soon, faster than the other muscles. So gravity has a considerable um, effect on how the disease progresses in the bodies of these children. And gravity, against gravity movements also cause a lot of damage to these muscles. So gravity eliminated exercises can benefit them a lot. Here, what they are performing are concentric contractions. And we will see the benefit of uh, these as compared to other exercises. So we can perform exercises for the trunk. These are abdominals. Uh, we can perform exercises for your hip. We can also perform exercises for shoulder which i haven't put the pictures here is that we can perform those uh, we can also add mild resistance to it so there is a spring attached here which is giving resistance to the hip muscles and here there is a mild uh, so very uh, low resistance theraband which gives resistance to the abductors now these devices should not be used unless prescribed by the physiotherapist and why is that? There, are, there is a reason for that, which I will explain in some time again. But resistance can be added if required in suspension therapy only if the physiotherapist advises you. This should not be done at home without supervision uh, because the way uh, muscular dystrophy muscles are to be trained is very different from how a non dystrophic muscle is trained. Now, active assisted exercise. So, apart from uh, suspension therapy, we can also do active assisted exercises wherein the therapist is personally supporting the patient or we are using certain devices to support the patient. So if you see here, we have given support to the elbow. So this is uh, in stage three, there may be some weakness in the elbow and the shoulder muscles also. So here the child is not able to perform quadruped positioning without the help of this plane. The elbows are bending, the triceps muscles have gone for weakness, which help us with the back of the elbow, which helps us to straighten the elbow. And because that muscle has undergone weakness, they're not able to keep it straight. So the, this elbow splint can be given to support. At the same time, to perform balance exercises or certain other exercises in standing, we can give them splints also. With the gait training. Now, this is the phase, uh, gait training is more so important in the fourth phase, which is early non-ambulatory phase, because in the beginning of that phase, we may be able to make them functional with uh, the gait training and assisted devices. But it is also important in this phase, towards the end of it, when they're about to lose their ambulation. So as you saw here, the child is not able to stand without the support of the splints. So if we give them the splints, we have to also teach him how to walk with the splints. Now there are two factors in gait training. One, there is weight of splints. There is additional weight of splints that this child has to uh, that the child has to lift to be able to walk. There is weight of the shoes also. So there is additional weight that the child has to lift. So for that, we have to do a lot of trunk strengthening, which can be achieved uh, by these exercises as well as uh, the kneeling exercises that I shown some time ago. So uh, if you remember, I'm just going back to that just to stress on how important. So these are the trunk strengthening exercises which are very important before gait training or during gait training. You see your kneeling, uh, shoulder and uh, hip strengthening. 
so before we start the gait training these muscles have to be strengthened in gait training what we uh, show is so it, it starts in parallel bars where the child is first standing on if you see here there's a lot of uh, increased distance in the two feet so we first teach them how to do the weight shifts if you see here where i'm teaching the weight shifts and then in the uh, straight position we teach them how to take weight on both the hands if required we can also give elbow splint here if the child is not able to keep their hands straight or able to take the weight of their body on their hands and then we uh, teach them how to take one step forward and slowly so i'm helping the child in the initial phase to learn the pattern uh, they have always learned how to walk by bending their hip and knee here they cannot do that so they have to learn how to walk with keeping their hip and knee straight so that is something that has to be taught now for any motor pattern to be learned it requires a lot of repetition and that's where the importance of rehabilitation uh, comes in picture so unless you take the child to a physiotherapist who is able to teach them the right pattern they will not be able to perform that activity so just giving the splint doesn't make it all right the child will not be able to walk immediately after wearing the splint they will need to learn how to walk using that splint and therefore this training they have to undergo this training with a qualified physiotherapist and under supervision once they are able to perform this then the amount of sessions that are given to physiotherapy can be reduced and the child can also exercise at home now slowly after so if you see here there's so much of distance in his feet there's such a wide base because he's not able to balance it all after practice you see here the distance has reduced a lot i'm still giving some support because the child is not confident about walking in the parallel bar without support so once this reduces the child is more upright uh, so if you see here uh, it's not very uh, visible but if you see here the lordosis is much more the child is you know he is jutting out his upper body uh, to balance himself but here it is in much better posture also once he is able to do that achieve the balance learn the pattern then we can move on to a walker once the child is able to perform movements on the walker we can move them on to the hand support or uh, we can also move them on to the uh, to sticks or they can walk without support also we can start initially in the parallel bar without any support so that if they require they have the parallel bars to hold and then move on subsequently without support another fourth stage uh, which is the non ambulatory early non ambulatory stage now here you see that the back of the thigh muscles so these are the muscles which are not really acting um, against the gravity a lot and therefore they undergo weakness considerably later as compared to other muscles it does not mean that these muscles do not undergo weakness at all in the previous stages every muscle is undergoing Uh, the damage and uh, the dystrophic process is right from birth but the weakness becomes more evident in these stages so that's what i'm pointing out so here the hamstrings uh, and the calf muscles undergo significant amount of weakness and uh, apart from that also the uh, deltoid muscles as we had seen earlier i have not highlighted it because i had shown it in the previous phase but the deltoid muscles and the triceps under hook more uh, weakness and it becomes very evident they may not be able to use their shoulder muscles at all along with that the trapezius the neck extensors so we see many times children may not be able to hold their neck up so they sit in this position where they are resting their neck uh, so they are trying to compensate for the muscle weakness with this change in the posture so that the neck can be controlled now if you could hear there was a lot of change in my voice also when i was sitting like this it's very difficult a to speak in that position and b also to swallow food in that position i was sitting like this and eating the the uh, the swallowing uh, is much easier because the pipe is straight open but if i'm sitting like this it's bent and because of that the swallowing also becomes difficult and it's uh, it's difficult for children to get proper nutrition they lose appetite is maybe too much too laborious to swallow as well 
so there is weakness in the shoulder muscles uh, the scapular muscles which leads to their drooping shoulder posture so the shoulders uh, droop down the children sink in their wheelchairs uh, and because of this they may also develop spinal deformities like scoliosis so instead of uh, it, it never goes down straight like that they will either go down on one side depending on which is their preference for uh, you know taking the support very rarely children would take support on both the sides so it's essential that at this stage in the early non ambulatory phase when they first move on to the wheelchair the wheelchair posture is maintained correctly or achieved correctly that can also be suggested by a therapist uh, an occupational therapist can help in that and the physiotherapist can also help in that but the parents must take or uh, should seek advice for this so that their posture is maintained properly uh one should avoid taking a very big wheel chair which leaves a lot of space between the body and the uh, hand rest oh, sorry between the body and the hand rest uh because if there is a lot of space the child can easily sink down in the wheel chair but if there isn't any space then they can rest their arms on the uh, on, on both the sides of the chair so here the children are wheelchair bound their sitting balance is very poor they are not able to perform overhead activities they are not able to sit upright uh, from the supine position so when they lie down they are not able to sit up they may develop scoliosis which may look something like this where there is a curvature to the spine uh, there may be upper extremity contractures like if you can see here in this picture there is uh, the elbow muscles have uh, become tight they are not he's not able to straighten the elbow completely the cardiac disorders are more prominent uh, gastrointestinal problems are more prominent some swallowing difficulty may start now there is something called a sleep apnea what happens is if there is uh, so these children also have something called as pseudo hypertrophy uh, which means that the muscle seems bulky and fat but there is no muscle tissue there so if you see body builders when they go to the gym and the muscles uh, bulk up or bulge up very well that is because the muscle fiber and the muscle size increases but in this children it's not the muscle but the fat tissue that is in between the muscle that gives that bulk this happens to the tongue also because tongue is also a muscle and it is uh, it can there can be pseudo hypertrophy in the tongue which uh, may hamper breathing while they are sleeping and so when they sleep they may have periods of breathlessness or periods of inability to breathe completely called as apnea so this is called a sleep apnea this may develop in this phase it's important to look out for that and take enough care and uh, do management to prevent that sleep apnea their speech may be altered as i said because of uh, the posture as well as the tongue hypertrophy so if my tongue is very heavy i'm not able to lift it properly i won't able i won't be able to speak also properly and the aspiration as i have already explained can also occur so here the respiratory exercises are important uh, the diaphragmatic so this if you see is the diaphragmatic exercises the father is helping him to understand how to breathe uh, through nose or mouth to keep the mouth closed when they breathe uh, diaphragmatic exercises are performed uh, so basically it uh, facilitates the diaphragm which is the primary muscle of breathing and it it, it enhances the chest volume or enhances the chest expansion most of the times because children are in scoliotic posture the rib cage is uh, you know not wide enough or the diaphragm is not occluded very well the diaphragm may also undergo weakness because again diaphragm is a muscle then we can also give resistance on different parts of the rib cage so here we have sort of seen the upper part and the lower part to increase the expansion of that part selectively So it's like a feedback mechanism that is used. One very common device used is the inspiratory spirometer, where which can improve the ability to take uh, take in more air volume to inspire. Now stretching exercises are very important in the previous stages. Also, I have put it all the more over here because this is the phase where they have become non-ambulatory and non. So the mobility is considerably reduced, and so. Uh, the tightness and contractures can set in very fast so what are the stretching exercises that can be done a for the hip flexors we can do the stretch for the hip flexors either in this position or in this position we can do stretches for the hamstrings which undergo 
tightness or uh, not so much of weakness but tightness very fast because what happens is that the quadriceps are not working they undergo weakness very soon and uh, because there is a lot of weakness these muscles are overacting and because they are overacting the knee is always in the bent position the children are not able to straighten it because it stays in the bent position eventually slowly it starts shortening and it becomes fixed in that position to avoid that so when it becomes fixed in that position that is what is called as a contracture to avoid that we have to do a lot of stretching exercises similar thing happens to the calf muscles also so we saw we see that in phase 4 the calf muscles start becoming weak before that they are quite strong as compared to their anterior counterparts the anterior muscles of the leg and therefore it is important to stretch these muscles because their children are walking on the toes also on the time so there is a lot of opportunity for the calf muscle and especially the tendon to be tight it is also very important to be careful when performing these stretches because the muscles are uh, scanty the elasticity of the muscle is very less and all we have to stretch is the fibro fatty tissue and the fibro fatty tissue cannot be stretched as effectively as the muscle if it has to be stretched it has to be stretched with graded loading for a longer time what it means is you can't quickly stretch the tissue you have to stretch it slowly and you have to slowly increase the amount of force you are exerting to stretch the muscle and it has to be kept for a much longer time as that of the muscle why is that the type of tissue is very different muscle is an elastic tissue that has extensibility so when you stretch it it gives way to to be able to stretch as the fibrous tissue fibro fatty tissue has very little elasticity and it is more uh, uh, we can say more plastic so we have to if we want to stretch the muscle uh, muscle we can stretch it a little bit and it can regain its extensibility but the fibro fatty tissue it has to be broken to the point where uh, the deformation in that tissue uh, cannot be recovered by the tissue processes so we have to give extra overload and it is beyond the uh, uh, beyond the ability of the tissue at that moment to break that tissue and then when it heals it can heal in the more lengthened position so this can be done by uh, surgical methods also so if manual stretching is not helping and if we feel that the length of the muscle being short is coming in the way of uh, function of the child we can go for surgical correction of deformities as well at this stage as well as in the previous stage if we feel it can help uh, prolong their walking and in this stage if we feel it can help prolong uh, their abilities uh, you know sitting abilities getting up uh, it is easy to manage because if uh, there are a lot of contractures their legs may not be uh, easy to manage or they may not be able to sleep properly on the bed the hips and knees are always bent they may not be able to sleep at all they may not be able to roll get up if the contractures are coming in way of their functionality then uh, surgery can be considered and for this uh, we need to take an opinion of the orthopedic surgeon uh, the physiotherapist would refer you to them and uh, they can take on from there one of the uh, good ways of stretching is also something called as instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization which uh, helps in, as i said which helps to break the fibro fatty tissue and the adhesions between them and give better length to the Uh, to the muscle now if you see here we can do uh, the stretching of ankle and uh, the knee with or without the splints uh, we also need to stretch the hand muscles here uh, for the elbow as well as the supinator pronator so the forearm muscles that help to turn the hand in was an arm and now stage 5 in stage 5 all of the muscles of the body are affected including the facial muscles so if we see facial muscles are also the skeletal muscles they they are affected at the end uh, very end phase of the disease but they are affected minimally and uh, at this stage it's we can start the exercises for facial muscles also and uh, rest of the muscles most of the leg muscles are completely withered away so there may not be any movement possible at this stage in the leg muscles 
There may be some movement preserved in trunk and upper extremity and with exercises we can prevent for the loss of that movement and we can see how we can enhance the functionality. But the mainstay of stage five would be respiratory care, gastrointestinal care, and uh, psychosocial uh, you know, counseling, psychological care of, for the patient as well as the caregivers. So this is what we see in phase uh, five, uh, quite uh, uh, contractures like you see here, hip knee contraction, which is preventing the leg from being uh, in the correct position. So positioning can be taught how to manage these contractures. So you see here, the patient has so many contractures, it's not possible for him to sleep uh, on his um, stomach uh, when, when he lies down. There's a uh, huge scoliosis here. This affects the breathing as well. Because if you see here, the ribcage is touching the pelvic bone that it is, you know, it's gone down so much that the ribcage cannot expand. You see here, there is severe uh, scoliosis as well as a lot of lordosis and uh, twisting of the spine. This 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 cachectic uh, sort of uh, appearance or the, if you see is very thin that's because of atrophy and also the nutritional um, uh, deficiency that can develop in this phase because they are not going to swallow the mobility is very less so there is no appetite and that can really hamper the health of the child as well so now when and how to start exercising for children with muscular dystrophy so as I said before, it is important that we start the exercise as early as possible. Why is that? Because when we start exercising early, we have a lot of muscle tissue that can be preserved, that can be made better, and that can be made a little bit more resistant to injury as, that, uh, as compared to the tissue that is never exercised. So we have to start as early as possible. How to start exercising? What kind of exercise should be performed? So I've shown you different examples. I'm going to go a little more in depth of how the muscles actually function in each of those exercises. So if you see here, muscle training and muscular dystrophy, what it says here is that So it says here that the effect, uh, the exercises have to be started early in, uh, in in their disease process and heavy resistance training should be avoided. So heavy resistance training and possibly some maximal resistance training may cause damage to the muscle fibers, which can be balanced by the activation of repair mechanism through satellite cells. Because these cells are considered to have a limited potential for cell division, one concern is that the satellite cell pool may be consumed prematurely if the diseased muscle is trained too hard, thereby causing a muscle weakness prematurely. So what this means is that if we give a lot of resistance and uh, like we train in, in the gym, you know, the bodybuilders, how they train themselves to get the muscle strength, or even if you don't want uh, a very hypertrophied muscle, even if you want to improve the strength, we give a lot of resistance to the movement. Now, this resistance is good because it causes damage to the muscle. When there is damage, the satellite cells come in and uh, repair the damage to produce new, healthy, and bigger and better muscle fiber. This happens in children with DMD also. But the amount of muscle damage, so if I work out or I, I do the exercise and there is a damage of 10% of the muscle is damaged, in muscular dystrophy children, the damage may be 30 to 40 percent or even more. If that is the, so there is a higher ratio. So the numbers I'm giving are arbitrary. There is no scientific evidence. I'm just saying this to explain the concept. Uh, if there is higher damage, then satellite satellite cells can repair this damage. But as I said earlier, the imbalance we may increase that imbalance between the injury and repair, and that may lead to premature weakness of the muscles also. So heavy resistance training should not be given to the children. So no use of heavy weights, heavy TheraBand activities, or uh, even the self weight like uh, you know, like doing push-ups, uh, like doing pull-ups. All of these activities should not be done by these children. And that's why when I said when we do the suspension exercises, if we put weights or if we use TheraBands and springs, it has to be done strictly under the supervision of physiotherapist who can grade the amount of resistance that is given. 
So another uh, form of exercise that is very deteriorating is eccentric contractions. So what are eccentric contractions? Eccentric contractions are the contractions which are required to prevent a uh, uh, you know, sudden drop of the limb towards gravity. So if I lift a glass of water, I have to hold the glass. Uh, so suppose I have to drink and then I'm holding the glass here. But the gravity is acting on uh, my hand. So if I have to keep it down, I have to keep it down slowly. If it's a glass, it can break if I keep it down very fast or with a very heavy force. This slow descent of the hand or this slow movement of the muscle. So the muscle is contracting but at the same time becoming longer. That is called as eccentric contraction. I don't want to be very technical. But this contraction is very harmful for the muscle. So if you see here, it causes myofibrillary dysfunction. Myofibril is the muscle cell. If you see here, eccentric contraction injury in dystrophic canine muscles. So this is a study that is performed in canines who had dystrophy, muscular dystrophy. Uh, unfortunately, the effect of these contractions uh, is not very well studied in human beings for obvious ethical reasons. Uh, so most of the evidence that comes regarding what type of contraction is good or bad in muscular dystrophy from the animal studies. Uh, if you see here, uh, eccentric exercise also increases the oxidative stress in the blood. And so if, if you see here, it says that uh, we're supposed to investigate how the oxidative stress uh, is built. Up. And within the 48 hours, we see that there is high intensity oxidative stress in uh, the body. Now, exaggeration of pathology by oxidative stress in respiratory and locomotor muscles with fusion muscular dystrophy. What the title says is that if there is exaggerated oxidative stress or if there is oxidative stress in the body, it, it, uh, it makes the process of muscular dystrophy much faster. So the disease can progress much faster if there is increased oxidative stress in the body. Now if you see here, eccentric contraction gives rise to oxidative stress and this stress can further contribute to worsening of the disease progression itself. So therefore, these type of contractures should be avoided. So we, uh, we should do isometric contraction where the body part is not moving at all, but the muscle is contracting or concentric contraction where the body part is moving in the, uh, where the muscle is shortening and the body part is moving. But, but we should not do eccentric contraction exercises. So we should, uh, we should do exercises, uh, we should not do exercises where there's a lot of resistance given, but we should perform movements like this is a suspension exercise in anti-gravity, uh, sorry, gravity eliminated plane, or another alternative is aquatic therapy. So we are going to come to that as to how aquatic therapy helps in preventing all of these harmful contractions and promoting good uh, contractions and exercises. So what are the do's? One should do regular exercise, moderate intensity at frequent intervals, where within the fatigue levels of the child. So once the child is tired, uh, exercise should not be performed. Regular stretching as well as strengthening exercises are required. Respiratory muscle training is very important. Nutritional support has to be given and make, make sure that it is up to the mark. Uh, attention to psychological well-being uh, should also be there. Be, uh, it's, uh, one should consult the appropriate professional for, uh, for exercise prescription, for supportive devices and for swallowing. And uh, water-based activities can be increased as compared to land-based activities. I will tell you very shortly why. What are the benefits of water-based activities? What one should not do? So don't overdo the exercise. What it means is don't exercise for hours together even when the child is tired. Don't give a lot of resistance. Don't make the child lift heavy weights. And don't ignore muscle tightness. So if there is slight tightness in the muscle stretching so that the muscle length is maintained very well. So what are the limitations of land-based rehabilitation? In phase one, so I have now... Uh, broken down uh, the disease in three phases where this is ambulatory, early non-ambulatory and late non-ambulatory. So in the phase one, eccentric activities can trigger uh, rapid damage of the muscles as discussed just now. 
there can be lactic acid accumulation which can trigger early fatigue uh, in phase 2 performing the exercise is either not possible because there is considerable muscle loss uh, so against gravity the movement is not possible at all and exercise to stimulate challenge or facilitate cardiovascular system is not possible so what it means is uh, the lack of mobility also gives rise to uh, sedentariness uh, for the cardiovascular system so we all know the uh, side effects of sedentary lifestyle on cardiovascular system the same thing happens in these children much earlier in their lives because they are very immobile much earlier on and in phase 3 there is severe activity limitation so the respiratory system is not uh, getting stimulated the cardiovascular system is suffering the gastrointestinal su uh, system is also suffering these are the limitations of land waste we have we are not able to overcome these limitations because uh, against gravity there is very little that we can provide even with the uh, suspension exercises and everything uh, the mobility still goes on deteriorating and uh, it's difficult to perform these exercises on land. But with water, in phase one, we can minimize the eccentric contractions just by minimizing the effect of gravity. The most advantageous um, property of water is buoyancy. Buoyancy is an upward force that uh, pushes a particular object outside the water, you know, on the surface of the water. And the gravity is pulling down, and buoyancy is pushing up. So it's a counteracting. So, because of that, the eccentric activity is much lesser because gravity is not there. Lactic acid accumulation is much lesser because of eccentric activity reduced. Uh, the, because the eccentric activity is reduced, lactic acid formation also reduces. Uh, exercises can be performed easily. So, the muscles that cannot perform in presence of gravity can perform in presence of, uh, in the absence of gravity or in reduced gravity very well. So the blood circulation improves, the cardiorespiratory systems are challenged or stimulated, the gastrointestinal system also improves, the kidneys function better. So there are multiple benefits of performing aquatic therapy. And in phase three, when on land nothing is possible, on in water some movements may still be possible. And uh, this can help in cardiovascular system the health of cardiovascular system can be enhanced just by immersion in water as well. So it can give a positive effect. Now imagine the amount of uh, psychological effect it will have on the child. If the child is not able to walk on land but is able to walk in water, it will help them uh, gain a lot of confidence. Uh, they experience a different freedom of movement in water at later stages when they are immobile on land. And that is very essential for psychological well-being of these children. Also, being in water releases certain hormones like dopamine. It increases uh, hormones like epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are uh, you know which help in elevation of the mood. So, water is known to have anti-anxiety and anti-depressant effect on the body. Just by being immersed in the water, we can feel that. So, if we combine the rehabilitation in water, it can have a much enhanced effect. So what are the properties of water that are unique uh, that help us in using this as a, um, as a treatment modality? Of course, it's colorless, odorless, it's a good solvent, good conductor of heat. The last one, uh, something to be careful of because it's also a good conductor of electricity. What are the therapeutic properties of water? As I said, one is density. Um, now, density is, uh, it, water has unit density. So anything that is above, uh, which has density of more than one will float on the water and uh, anything that has density of less than one will uh, sorry above one will sink in the water and anything that has less than one will float in the water the buoyancy as i said earlier buoyancy is the force that uh, uh, pushes an object upward it is kind of uh, counteracting the gravity so body is always in the rotational uh, sort of uh, uh, body always experiences a rotational force uh, if uh, the two centers, so there is a center of gravity and center of buoyancy, if these are not aligned properly, the body may experience a rotational force. Now, because of this buoyancy, we experience weightlessness. Now, well, how much of weightlessness can one perceive when immersed in water? So, if it's uh, at the level of shin, then uh, the weightlessness is 15%. So, what happens is we can perceive 85% of the body weight. So if I am 
So if a person uh, weighs, uh, say, 50 kgs or the person weighs 100 kgs, then uh, it will, uh, if, and if they are walking in shin deep water, they will, their ankles will only perceive 85 kgs. If they are walking in knee deep water, their ankles will only perceive 65 kgs. If they are walking in high deep water, sorry, waist deep water, then their knees and ankles will only perceive 50 kg. And they are walking in uh, chest deep water, their ankle and uh, knees and hips will only perceive 25 to 30 kg. And if they are in neck deep water, then the, the whole body will only feel 10 kg of weight. So that's so much of, so 90% of the body weight can be reduced when they are immersed in water, which will improve their ability to walk, ability to perform movements very drastically. Now, although it reduces the uh, effect of gravity, water is much thicker than air. So there is a, the viscosity or the stickiness of the water is much more than the air. And because of that, any movement performed in water has, gives a resistance to the move, gives a resistance. Now, this is almost like performing a suspension activity because the gravity is not working. Gravity is not as effective. And therefore, any movement that we do is not producing harmful contractions like eccentric contractions, but giving us the benefit of training, resistive training also. So, uh, cohesion and uh, adhesion again uh, are the qualities that uh, give rise to uh, the resistance provided by the water. Hydrostatic pressure. pressure. This is the pressure that, that is exerted by water on uh, all the bodies that are immersed uh, inside. And uh, so at the deeper we go, the, the more is the pressure uh, perceived by the body. Uh, it, is, it is exerted equally to, uh, to, uh, from all the sides of the object or the body part. So why is this important? Uh, what happens in muscular dystrophy is because the muscles are not active, the blood tends to pool in the extremities or the blood gets stuck in the extremities. And this blood is not pumped back to the heart. If it is not pumped back to the heart, the heart will not be able to give out enough blood to the body again. And this pooling gives rise to edema, sluggish blood flow that can cause clots. So a lot of problems can start because of the edema. Now, uh, the hydrostatic pressure helps to pump the blood back to the heart. So this is how it helps in maintaining the cardiovascular systems also. And uh, the hydrostatic pressure is the, is the property of the water that gives this benefit. Second property, second benefit of hydrostatic pressure is for breathing. Because it's compressing onto the rib cage as well, the respiratory muscles have to work more to breathe uh, as compared to on the land. Now, this is also something that a therapist needs to be very careful about because if the patient is not able to um, breathe in properly or the respiratory muscles are already very weak in taking the children in water can be risky. Therefore, aquatic therapy should be strictly done under supervision of a trained therapist who understands what are the implications of muscular dystrophy on the body and how the body will uh, react differently to water when taken inside the pool or what precautions are to be taken when the child is taken inside the pool. So compressibility, water can't be compressed, which also uh, helps in giving uh, resistance to the movements. Refraction is pretty much uh, an, a quality that is uh, that is more uh, needed for the therapist, not for the treatment. It's not very important to understand. Uh, the drag force or the eddy currents that are formed by so any object when it moves in water, uh, the water gives resistance to you know against that movement as well. So it pulls that <clears throat> object in the opposite direction. Um, uh, so it pushes that object in the opposite direction. And so it gives more resistance. Uh, depending upon the shape of the objects, this resistance changes. So we can uh, give exercises to these children in, in a particular way to make it easy or difficult just by changing the body position. And that is very important. Now, relative density, as I said, Sorry. Relative density is, uh, as I explained earlier, if the density is above 1, then the object will sink. If it's below 1, then it will float. 
what is very important to know is in muscular dystrophy there's a lot of fibrosis and fatty infiltration and so the tissue density changes in muscular dystrophy usually a non dystrophic muscle will sink in water but a dystrophic muscle will float on water especially in the later stage of disease where there is considerable fibrosis uh, fibrotic replacement and this is something the therapist has to understand so it's not necessary that every patient will find it easy to perform activities in water it may be difficult if the if the body part is floating more it may be difficult for them to control their activities in water as well and therefore again i would stress that it is essential aquatic therapy is performed under supervision only um, and not uh, not by uh, by the patients themselves so how water can make activities easy so if you see here this person is trying to stand up on land it is not possible sorry so he is a patient of muscular dystrophy adult patient of muscular dystrophy you see here in water he is able to perform sit to stand activities very easily without any problem this is how so now what is the benefit in this the muscles can perform the activity uh the posture is good so the chances of uh, tightness and contractures can be reduced and the muscle health can be improved <coughs> excuse me now if you see here uh, this child is not able to straighten the knee at all outside the water and uh, briefly you will see how he is able to perform the movement in the water if you, if you can see here he is able to completely straighten almost completely straighten the knee uh what it shows is that now if uh the child keeps doing this movement more often then the knee flexion contracture would set in much later as compared to uh only with land exercises so uh when we are doing aquatic therapy assessment special consideration has to be given to respiratory assessment why is that so this is a child who is breathing uh outside uh on, on land and if you see here he is able to breathe in 100 and, uh, sorry 1700 ml of air on land but when he is trying to do that in water he is able to breathe only 500 ml so i'm going to show that video again he is able to breathe 1700 ml of air on land but in water he is able to breathe only 500 ml so there is that much of difference in the respiratory ability of a uh, person when immersed in water and all the more of duchenne muscular dystrophy children because their respiratory muscles are in um will uh, maybe weak so therefore respiratory assessment needs a special consideration if a person is not able to breathe in even 250 ml of air on land that uh, child should not be taken in water unless uh, it's an experienced aquatic therapist who knows uh, how to uh, take care uh, in these situations so it's not a complete contraindication but uh, by parents themselves uh, definitely the child is not able to breathe to another fifty ml don't take the child in the field second consideration is pseudo hypertrophy so pseudo hypertrophy is bulging of the muscles uh, which is not because of muscle volume but fat volume why is that because uh, so we see this very commonly on calf gluteal muscles tongue and forearm muscles uh, what precautions have to be taken is it can elicit different metacentric effect so because that particular part of the body will be more floaty it's like attaching to floats so if the hip muscles are uh, uh, hypertrophy so sometimes they show that gluteal muscles are hypertrophy calf muscles are hypertrophy it's literally like attaching to float to that part of the body and it becomes very floaty and if other muscles are not strong enough the child may not be able to manage himself at all in the water and he may immerse his face Uh, in the water and may not be able to recover from that position and this increases the chances of drowning significantly so it doesn't mean that it's uh, not safe for children to do the aquatic therapy but it has to be done under professional supervision tongue pseudo hypertrophy may also lead to poor mouth closure so the child may not be able to close the mouth completely and so there is a risk of in, uh, in ingesting the water or drinking the water which is not good for them so uh, what are the special considerations need to be given is uh, for the contractures when there is hip knee contracture ankle contracture scoliosis all of these contractures can be very difficult to manage inside the water so the therapist needs to be aware of this and 
take care of these contractors before entering the field. Uh, another uh, important thing is uh, neck muscle weakness and facial muscle weakness. If the neck muscle uh, is very weak, then the child again has uh, there is a risk that the face can go in water and can be harmful. Same goes for facial muscle weakness, where uh, if there is poor oromotor control, child may not be able to close the mouth and drink. So there is a case report that I would like to talk about. Uh, there was a 10-year-old uh, uh, child of facial muscular dystrophy. Uh, who was treated at our institute, uh, who was given uh, regular land-based rehabilitation and uh, cell therapy, and then there was uh, uh, aquatic therapy as well. And when he went home, he continued aquatic therapy uh, till uh, 17 months. And we have compared the results of how he performed uh, on different outcome measures as compared to uh, 13 other children who had received stem cell therapy in uh, our institute but did not receive uh, uh, continual aquatic therapy. So they received aquatic therapy sessions uh, in the beginning but they could not continue that at home. So what was the difference between that? So when this child uh, was assessed before stem cell therapy, uh, these were the scores. So he scored 43 on 56 on work balance scale, 14 on 34 on North Star ambulatory scale, and walk for 350 meters or six minute walk distance, 107 on fin, two on Brook scale, two on Vignor scale, and he was able to breathe in only 1500 ml. Uh, this is his improvement in the next 17 months. So from 43, the score improved to 46 at the end, uh, end of 17 months. There was a higher improvement at six months, but as the naturally the disease is progressive, uh, we see that there may be some deterioration in the improvement that is seen. So the score improved from 43 to 46. The North Star ambulatory score briefly improved, but then it, it came back to its original score. The FIM score improved and the improvement persisted until the end of 17 months. So what this shows is that although there was deterioration in uh, some of the factors, the child had learned uh, very well how to do his day-to-day -day activities. So uh, two modified techniques. The Brook scale uh, was maintained at the end of seven months and Vignor scale improved at the end of seven months. So Brook scale is for upper extremity function, Vignor scale is for lower extremity function. Uh, so this was an ambulatory child who got treated. Uh, maximum uh, air that he could breathe was 100 and, sorry, 1,500 ml in the beginning. It improved to 2,250 ml at the end of 17 months. Now, when we compare this with the age match control group, uh, almost having a similar follow up duration, we see that there was so the uh, North Star score was maintained uh, in them also. But the FIM score, if you see here from 83 to 77, so it dropped considerably uh, in the control group, and this drop was statistically significant as well. And the same uh, can be seen in the Vignor scale. So in the Vignor scale, if the scale score, uh, so there was a, a worsening of the Vignor score and that was also statistically significant. Now what is more interesting is to see uh, is the change in the muscle strength. So uh, for the patient that I'm talking about that we treated with aquatic therapy, there was improvement in most of the muscles and maintenance in some of the muscles. At the end of 17 months, which is great because for one and a half year, he did not reduce the strength of the muscles. It actually improved. But there was progression of certain symptoms and mainly because uh, there was not so much of improvement in the knee muscles and the hip muscles uh, for uh, you know, to perform certain activities uh, ambul like ambulation and functional activity. So the balance, there was some deterioration in balance, there was some deterioration in the Vignor scale. That was because the uh, some specific muscles had undergone not so much of improvement or uh, were just maintained. And so it, he was not able to perform those functions. He'd also grown in the height significantly, so he put on a little bit of weight. So all of these factors uh, contributed to that. Now, if you see in the control group, uh, the hip extensors uh, reduced from grade 5 to 4. So there was deterioration in the strength in the control group, whereas in him, there was improvement. And that deterioration was statistically significant. 
in adductors also there was statistically significant deterioration but he improved in the muscle strength so you can see in most of the hip and the shoulder muscles which are anti gravity muscles there was improvement in him whereas in the control group there was deterioration so aquatic therapy helps to minimize the effect of gravity and prevents the muscle damage caused by anti gravity movements and therefore to start we should start it early in the disease and continue it till the later phases also because it has it gives a lot of benefit to the child not only the muscle strength but also for cardio respiratory functions and gastrointestinal function now we have spoken so much about the rehabilitation how we can rehabilitate the children when on land in water how aquatic therapy can benefit the children more but despite of this rehabilitative treatments there is no cure for the disease that is not curing the disease or slowing down the progression of the disease so what can be done so right now what is the treatment available uh, a the medical treatment like steroids which can slow down the disease progression by slowing the inflammation some anti fibrotic treatments as well that can slow down the progression surgical management of contractures and deformities nutritional supplements and ventilatory support to eventually prolong the life span and uh, fda has also uh, approved some gene therapies uh, which can help in progress uh, in, in delaying the progression of the disease these are not enough there is still a need for a more effective strategy for uh, treatment because the pathophysiology of dmd has multiple um, uh, it's multifaceted there are as i had shown in the first figure there are different things not just the muscle dying but it's also the lot lack of blood supply it's also the chronic inflammation it's also the nerve damage it's fibrosis it's fused apoptosis everything is at play and so there has to be something that can address all of these problems uh symptoms uh, begin not because the muscles are damaged but because there are not enough cells to repair that damage so repair process in the body is intact but there are not enough repairing cells so while uh, we we are able to figure out how to completely cure the gene defect uh the other option or the other strategy could be to improve the repair mechanism of the body because we can't do anything to help the muscles that are getting damaged because there is a genetic defect so is there any other way where we can improve uh, the repair mechanism and that is through stem cells uh stem cells are the cells that can uh, divide uh, endlessly to either as themselves or different muscles uh, sorry different tissues depending upon their potency they can be a pluripotent cell which can form all part of Uh, all tissues of the body, uh, multi-potent cells which can form only certain type of tissues, unipotent cells which can form only one type of tissue, like satellite cells which can only form muscle. So these stem cells can be used uh, to treat these children, uh, to improve their repair mechanism, so to slow down the progress of the disease, or for some time we can even halt the progression of the disease. So how do these cells work? They can multiply to form copies of themselves. they can form different types of tissues also secrete certain chemicals that reduce the inflammation in the body that protect the muscles from further damage and these positive chemicals can also uh, protect the nerves from further damage they improve the blood supply of the uh, body so stem cells can be given with various uh, different routes at our institute we give intrathecally in the in uh, cerebrospinal fluid and intramuscularly in the motor point to prevent damage to the muscles so what are the different types of stem cells as i said embryonic uh, stem cells are there uh, umbilical cord stem cells adult stem cells we use adult stem cells because they are safe they do not form any tumors they there is no rejection they can be obtained very easily and there are no ethical issues regarding these cells So we performed a study in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which was a retrospective controlled study. What it means is that we studied children who received stem cell therapy, which were 261 children who received uh, cellular therapy, and 55 children who did not receive this treatment. And then we followed them for 22 months, that is almost two years, 
um, and we found we we tried to compare for how long were the children ambulatory or at what age did these children lose the ability to walk and we found there was a difference of 13 months so there was a gain of 13 months uh, in the time to loss of ambulation so a child with was uh, who, who received stem cell therapy was able to walk for 13 months more as compared to a child who did not receive this. So this is just a glimpse of the results that we have uh, got with the uh, cells. We have published these findings uh, in various journals. So we have a study uh, on various types of muscular dystrophy patients which showed 87% of the patient showed some improvement uh, in the in in the initial phase after the treatment. Uh, we also published the first paper in the world on limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Uh, apart from that, we have 18 other scientific publications on uh, stem cells. Uh, so if you want to find out more information about how cellular therapy can benefit in muscular dystrophy, uh, stay tuned, Dr. Nandini Gopulchandran, the Deputy Director of Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute. She would be conducting a webinar about uh, use of cell therapy in different neurological and neuromuscular disorders in the month of September. You can get more information about that on neurogenbsi.com or uh, neurogen.in. These are both of our websites. You can also find uh, the information on our Facebook page. Uh, so you can check on that and, and register for the next webinar to find out how stem cells can help in the management of uh, muscular dystrophy. And thank you very much. Uh, you've been very patient. Uh, I, I think I spoke for quite a long time, much in detail. I hope it was helpful and I could clear your doubts or I could give you more uh, guidance about how to take care of children with tuition muscular dystrophy. Uh, we've also published a book uh, on tuition, uh, on muscular dystrophy, different types, which includes tuition muscular dystrophy. And I have co-authored that book so if any of you would like to uh, read more or find out more information about this disease and its management, you can again log on to our websites www.neurogenpsi.com or neurogen.in and uh, this book is available free of cost for download uh, in the PDF format. You can read it and get more information uh, and thank you very much for being here. So I'm just going to check if there are any questions and if, uh, if, if anybody has asked any questions, I would be answering those now. Okay, so there is a question by Danish Sayyid uh, and his question is, uh, he, so he said that I asked, uh, sorry, um, I read somewhere that the stem cell therapy is only effective when it's taken in childhood. Is it true? So the answer to this is not simple. Uh, yes, the stem cell therapy may be more effective in childhood because there is more muscle to preserve. So we may be able to see the improvements very evidently earlier on in the age. It does not mean it is more effective earlier on in the age. As the children grow old also, we can treat them and they can get good benefit. Uh, the benefit is more in terms of preserving their uh, muscle strength and uh, you know stopping the deterioration or slowing down the deterioration. We work more on respiratory function, upper extremity function, sitting balance, uh, ability to eat, and ability to perform movements with uh, upper extremity as the disease progresses. Whereas earlier on in the disease, we work more towards preserving the lower leg function. But it can help both in the earlier as well as the later stage of the disease. Second question, what would be the indication to in incorporate cardiac management? Um, sorry, I'm not able to read it clearly. One second. Uh, when the CDX deep friction is Oh, sorry, two different questions, uh, I beg your pardon. So what would be the indication to incorporate uh, cardiac management? Uh, so first indication uh, can, if the child is showing any evident symptoms like breathlessness, inability to perform movement, excessive fatigue as that compared to before, 
uh, palpitations, uh, then well, you definitely need to uh, you know find a cardiologist or refer uh, or talk to your physiotherapist or talk to your physician. Uh, but before these symptoms crop up, as I said, from stage two, it is good to monitor and do ECGs and 2D echoes of the children at least every year. So once in a year, if we do these two tests, they can usually pick up any uh, cardiac abnormality and uh, you can then consult the physician and cardiologist subsequently to get the cardiac uh, medication required for the child. Whether celiac uh, deep friction is helpful. So yes, uh, we can do the deep friction uh, as well for soft tissue mobilization uh, and breaking the adhesions. What we have to realize though is the fibrotic processes uh, in, in these children are also increasing or are also enhanced. So we have, we, we can't lose a lot of soft tissue mobilization and a very high intensity uh, friction or high intensity soft tissue mobilization uh, in the areas which already have a lot of fibrosis. So it can be done in the earlier stages to prevent contractures. But if there are contractures, we have to go for a slow, uh, so slowly uh, increasing the load of uh, graded loading for stretching of the uh, connective tissue. Mm -hmm. There's another question uh, did not get about sleep apnea. Okay, so sleep apnea is uh, is is basically what happens when the children. And a sleep apnea can happen because of uh, respiratory muscle weakness also. Two, the children have pseudo hypertrophy of the tongue, which means that their tongue is, uh, is, is it increases in the size, it loses its strength. So they're not able to move their tongue very well. So when they sleep, their tongue doesn't stay down and straight, it falls backwards and falls on the uh, um, on the wind pipe. And it blocks the windpipe. And when that happens, they are not able to breathe for a short duration. Of course, the body gives a signal, and the child may change the position or wake up from sleep, and then you know, voluntarily is able to move the tongue and uh, you know, open up the windpipe. So that brief period of inability to breathe is called sleep apnea, and that uh, that that can be seen uh, in children in later stages so stage four and five we can see sleep apnea in some children so uh, there are some suggestions also that cycling is very helpful in cardiorespiratory fitness and um, so yes i completely agree with that uh, cycling is very helpful uh, in cardiorespiratory fitness but as i said earlier on in the disease they can do cycling but when the muscles of the lower extremity become so weak that they're not able to perform this movement, we have to find alternatives like suspension therapy or aquatic therapy to keep them, uh, keep their cardiac therapy good. So, these are the only questions so far. I'm just going to wait for one more minute to see if there are any more questions. Uh, if not, I, I would be taking your leave. Once again, thank you all for uh, being there and uh, listening to my webinar so intensely. I really hope uh, that it has helped you all uh, and uh, you could get some more information about rehabilitation of uh, muscular dystrophy. Uh, as I said, do download the book if you want to read more about it from our website and be on a watch uh, to know more about how cell therapy can be uh, used to treat uh, uh, to manage the children with muscular dystrophy. So thank you very much. Uh, have a very good night uh, to everybody in India. And uh, we would see you again in the